Welcome to the place where we learn about and learn from the leaders in our field who are powering human creativity. I'm Aaron Dworkin, and this is Arts Engines. <laughs> Thanks again for joining me here on Arts Engines. Today's guest is Curtis Stewart, who serves as not only the composer in residence of the Sphinx Virtuosi, but also artistic director of the American Composers Orchestra. Curtis, welcome to the show. What's up? Hey, great to be here. Yeah. So I am so excited to have you on the show. Obviously, so deeply honored and excited that you have this incredible role with the Sphinx organization, with the Sphinx Virtuosi. You also, of course, are a leading composer and violinist, just overall an extraordinary musician, and this leadership role with, um, with ACO, with American Composers Orchestra. Uh, and of course, uh, ACO, also one of our uh, creative partners for Sphinx, but the Sphinx organization was our co-curator for this particular episode. So I'm so excited to kind of delve into a little of, uh, for our audience, kind of one kind of just how you view, a lot of times they hear about a composer in residence for an orchestra or for an organization, things like that. So I was wondering kind of a, a bit of a two part, but kind of initially just how do you view that? Uh, and kind of how do you see your role as the composer in residence for the Sphinx Virtuosi? And, and by that, what I mean is sometimes people look and say, oh, okay, this person just kind of, you know, writes a piece or something like that. How do you view it? And do you view it as a partnership? Just kind of curious how you come at it. I'm always viewing writing for people as tailoring my musical spirit and energy for the person and their interests and vision and passions. Um, so with Sphinx, uh, I was really interested in the idea of bringing music um, from outside the concert hall into the concert hall and what would fit those players. I mean, of which I know so many of the virtuosi players over the years, um, the music that they listen to, the music they relate to, um, and, and tapping into their energy tailored with my own musical spirit. And, uh, you know, through my work with the American Composers Orchestra, I'm constantly telling composers to own the space that they take up. When they step into a room with an orchestra, it's not just that the orchestra is doing them a favor, they're actually bringing a new set of ideas, a new culture. They're, they are a catalyst in what could be a very um, static environment. So for me, as the composer, I think of myself as kind of the rabble, the, the joyful rabble rouser in residence. That's kind of the idea. So with this piece that I wrote for, uh, for the Virtuosi featuring uh, Britton Rene, uh, amazing drum set player, I, I, I've always been interested in the John Cage prepared piano pieces where he throws all these like gadgets and percussive, but it makes, it makes the piano sound like a percussion instrument, almost sound like a gamelan instrument. Um, and I, I was interested in what, they would, what would happen similarly with a prepared drum set. So I talked to Brit Renee about her favorite types of sounds. So we have a go-go bells, we have a djembe, we have like a, a muted bass drum that sounds like the 808 kick drum from, a, from, from electronics music, a muted snare drum, all these instruments that emulate electronics music um, and then that got me thinking about what would happen if we brought the music of um, hip hop, specifically drill music, into the concert hall. So drill music has a really textured, morally complicated lineage. Um, and my the way I tapped into that was during the pandemic. So we were stuck in our houses. We were stuck inside, inside. And then suddenly in New York, we had outside dining. And so we could just go out and sit and eat. And normally me and my wife would just sit out there and just try to chill out because we were bottled up inside. But in, we're, in my neighborhood where I lived at the time, Inwood, which is like just on the edge of the Bronx in New York, um, what you would hear when you're outside are all these motorcycles kind of like revving their engines because that was their version of, of letting off some steam. 
these really loud, like probably like 20 motorcycles going up and down Broadway. Um, and they would be playing this music that had this really long hi-hat pattern. And a really slow bass pattern. And I was like, I, I'm really into that. So I started looking that up and trying to find ways of bringing that into an orchestral setting. And I learned that it was drill music. And I learned that it that is tapped into the, the certain cultures of uh, urban you know, situations. And I just wondered what would it be like if this was my outside music, if this was my hunting call music, like Brahms, like, you know, like all these classical composers, um, especially with this prepared drum set. Um, and what would happen if we bring that music into the classical space? It's, it's just incredible. And I love how just sharing part of your creative process, it was like a window into, you know, your creativity. And it's just amazing. And, I'm, and imagining, of course, the extraordinary members of the Virtuosi, you know, bringing this to life. And oh, my gosh, it, it's it's going to be incredible. Everyone in the audience should be checking it out. Um, is there... Do you have kind of a, a a goal in mind for the your expected audience? Like, in other words, is there something that you'll be like, this really worked out if the audience feels something or experiences something? Just wondering, kind of as the composer, do you have a goal for the audience? For this piece specifically, it's it's trying to be lit, it's trying to get everybody as lit as possible. That's the that's the goal. So if they if they if they're kind of tepid and kind of doing the normal golf clap classical applause at the end, I have totally failed. Um, the, <laughs> I mean the drum set part, um, it just elevate the the idea is um, taking a musical motive specifically from um, pop drum uh, pop smokes Dior, don 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 don, and then we go we go, and you those two ideas kind of get twisted and turned about and then the drum set is there to expand the string orchestra in, into new rhythmic love new rhythmic energies awesome uh, and so the, the whole form happens twice so something happens for the first like four minutes and then it happens again with variations to level to level up the energy and so basically the idea is what happens if a hip-hop motive had variation and development that those that's the kind of idea and so i'd love for the audience to both be elevated emotionally but also be asking a what if question absolutely truly amazing truly amazing so then you also got another work for two solo violins with the virtuosi and just wondering if you could share a little about that yeah so I am so excited to be writing for Joe McGrevis. I mean, she's awesome. I play, I did a concert with her when she was still at school at Juilliard. And I was just sitting next to her. I was like, that is not fair. <laughs> As a violinist, she's just like a violinist, violinist. So it's amazing what she can do. Anyway, and Ty Murray, who is another, uh, I remember when she won Sphinx. Two just extraordinary musicians. So that's got to be exciting just in and of itself. Yeah, I mean, and Joma, I mean, of course, she's a violinist, violinist, and Ty, I remember when she won that first Sphinx, and I was just, I don't know how, I, that was in 1998, or was it, was that 2001? You got it, exactly. Yeah, so I was 12, I was 12, and I remember seeing her and be like, wow, that, just, what is this competition? And so I, I looked up to her for quite a, quite a, quite a bit. So to be able to write for both of them, um, basically that piece is, takes a mixture of um, the technical difficulties of like a vi the Vinyasky duos. He wrote all these amazing little duos for viol two violins. You know, people are going up and down the instrument, playing all kinds of, you know, bariolage and arpeggios and um, mixed with, there's, there are these Prokofiev duos for violin, two violins. And there's just so much intricacy in the way the, the parts mesh. And then I had this great conversation with Joma about some of her um, musical background. And so we talked about gospel music. We talked about um, Lena Horne. We talked about the duos of various jazz singers. And so I tried to, and I, I really connected with that. And so that's where I'm tailoring my own musical energy around her inspirations. And so it's a mixture of Vinyasky, Prokofiev, and 
jazz gospel singer. <laughs> so, so cool. Everyone in our audience should be going to Sphinx's website to see when the virtuosi will be performing near you. Um, and uh, it really is just extraordinary work, creativity um, that you bring to life. Uh, it really is amazing. Uh, we're just about out of time, but I always like to ask of all my guests, right, in this composing process, there have to be, right, these amazing moments. Everything is just flowing and you and you love it, but there's got to be some challenging times or when it feels like something's not coming or you're not able to bring it to, to paper or bring it to life. And just wondering, as a leader, as an artistic leader, do you have any mechanisms that might be helpful for anyone in our audience when they find themselves in those times that helps you get past obstacles and challenges? Yeah, I think about um, the nature of inspiration. I think a lot of times we think of it as like lightning striking, which is kind of true, but it's also a daily practice. So as you create art, every piece of art that you create is not going to be like this genius thing that happens, but it's a daily practice of just getting some words onto the paper, recording some sounds on your voice memo, you know, just editing editing some material you have. Like I, I think when you create art, you see art. And so it, things become a little more available to you so that when you're in those hard moments, it's the same as the work you would do on a daily basis when you're not quote unquote inspired. And you just try things out, quit twist. You, tr you know, you're seeing outside of the box that you built for yourself and learning what you actually, a lot of times, um, there's a there's a saying that you have to in, in writing, like uh, literary writing, um, you have to learn what which one of your babies you have to just totally cut out. There's whole sections that you have to just remove and learning to let go of your own creations is almost just as important as pushing through and and remaining uh, disciplined and trying to st stick with it. So learning how to kind of go back and forth between those two things is a personal Thing to get used to it and you never you never know you never know what's going to come out i think that's the that's the big takeaway for me curtis stewart you truly are one of the arts engines who is powering yeah. human creativity in our world thank you so much for everything you've created thank you for partnering with sphinx and thank you so much for being on the show thank you it's a pleasure